The last time AMD had the fastest gaming GPU was back when the company launched the R9-290X based on the GCN2 microarchitecture 11 years ago now. I remember buying one not long after launch. I waited for a partner car that would have enough cooling capacity to cool the enormous 438mm2 die that drew 290 watts at max load, the largest GPU AMD has ever designed for a consumer product. Earlier that year, AMD AMD's rival NVIDIA had released the GTX Titan at a whopping $1,000 and a cut-down version in the form of the GTX 780. The 290X was so fast that it beat the more expensive 780 and even the $1,000 Titan. Quite the embarrassment for Jensen Huang's company, who was definitely caught with his pants down. NVIDIA was forced to release the 780 Ti as a result. But for a brief few months, AMD had the top spot. They were the fastest and even after the 780 Ti launched, many games ran faster on AMD's card, and the 290X even widened its lead as time went on. From a PC enthusiast's perspective, the 290X was a tremendous success for Team Red. Eleven years later, however, it's clear that topping the performance charts doesn't seem to do much for AMD's sales or market share. It's now 2024, and AMD have confirmed that they are leaving the high-end market as recent rumors have been suggesting, at least for the foreseeable future, after many failed attempts at disrupting NVIDIA's dominance. What happened in this last decade that forced AMD to give up on the high end now? Is this even the right call from Lisa Su and team? And more importantly, will AMD be forced to make this a permanent decision? In my previous life before Cortex, I worked as an information architect and as part of the job there was a lot of coding involved, mostly on the front end but also on the back end. <laughs> I wish I had had a resource like boot.dev back then, who is today's sponsor, as it would have made learning a new programming language a much easier process. Boot.dev uses gamification to keep you focused and engaged in learning the Python and Go programming languages, making the process feel like a a captivating online RPG game where you constantly raise the bar and gain new skills and rewards. It's all done online and it's self-paced, with daily quests you can do that involve applying your new programming skills as you learn. According to Stack Overflow, the median salary for back-end developers in the US last year was over $100,000, and on top of the great earning potential in this field, many programming jobs offer the option to work remotely or from home. The boot.dev platform is designed to steer you away from boredom and getting you writing a ton of code, because getting your hands on the keyboard and shipping projects is the only way to really learn. If you get stuck, you have an AI assistant bear called Boots right on the website that can help you understand the trickier topics. Or you can head over to the active and welcoming Boot.dev Discord community if you need further help. The folks there will be happy to assist you. There's a free demo for each course if you want to try it out. So click the link in the description box and use my code CORTEX to get 25% off your first month or even your entire first year if you choose the annual plan. A big thanks to Boot.dev for being our sponsor today. Looking at the GPU shipments since the first quarter of 2013, when the 290X came out, so these are PC GPUs only, laptop and desktop. Data center is not included here. We can see three major spikes, these first two corresponding to the two crypto mining booms that made use of GPU arithmetic for mining, and following the massive post-mining crash of 2021 till the end of 2022, we see another spike from last year on the back of the AI high that led to a lot of gaming DGPU sales from parties that normally wouldn't be buying them, mainly AI labs and startups. But if we look outside these outliers, we can see that the market only seems to be able to support around 100 million GPUs shipped yearly. Remember, that's not accounting for things like AMD's console chips, which obviously include GPUs, or Nvidia's non-gaming focused GPUs. These are strictly desktop and laptop GPUs. By the way, in case you are wondering, 
the downward spikes are normal as they are the Q1 withdrawal symptoms after people have spent their holiday bonuses at the end of the year. So they are market corrections. So out of 100 million yearly, what would be AMD's share of the pie? Camp Marketing has it at a mere 7% of the market, including system integrators. This is based on channel shipments, which I find a more accurate number than Joe Paddy's research metrics. If you are looking for AMD's RDNA 3 on the chart, it's the green line that makes up the bottom of the chart. AMD's best performing GPU is still Polaris, with RDNA 2 being close to finally matching it. In fact, the only RDNA 3 card that seems to be doing okay is the RX 7600, thanks to AMD's aggressive pricing. Looking on Newegg.com, we see it hits that $250 sweet spot that has always been what AMD fans seem willing to pay. So that's the Polaris buyers, basically. That's the one segment where AMD still seems to have some presence. If we ignore SIs, we see a trend of gradual decline of AMD's share with PC enthusiasts, going from 21% in 2019 to 18% last year. Now, there's no point in going to exhaustive precision with these numbers because there's a high likelihood that all of these companies are selling GPUs through other channels, either directly or via intermediaries. You just have to look at the progress that Chinese companies are showing in AI to suspect that there are probably millions of GPUs unaccounted for in the financials that AMD, Nvidia and Intel make public. But it's a good enough overview of the market share that indicates to us that despite having tried multiple strategies and technologies, from Mantle and DX12 support in the 290X to HBM in the Fury and Vega cards, taking the lead in adopting TSMC 7 nanometer node with the Radeon 7 and then the move to chiplets with RDNA 3. The practical results are a constant decline in market share compared to Nvidia. John Paddy Research's numbers do confirm this, albeit with an even lower number for AMD's share of the market at 12%. So what happened that got the market into a virtual monopoly by Nvidia? Some would argue that the individuals who were willingly giving AMD their allegiance and who would buy AMD's GPUs no matter how badly the company positioned them have abandoned the company after repeated disappointments and the price creep that has tried to match Nvidia without offering the same level of performance and features. And I think there's validity to that argument and it's something I've discussed at length in the past. AMD's numerous blunders, especially when it comes to pricing and marketing, have led many loyalists to switch teams or to just stop carrying and holding on to their GPUs for much longer than they normally would. But I think the problem is deeper than that. While Nvidia doesn't break down the specific amount they spend on marketing each year, they group this number under the SGNA. So for the past five years, we see a steady increase over the years to a stratospheric $2.7 billion this year in marketing. Yes, that does include other things beyond just marketing, but you can bet marketing is the lion's share of that. AMD, on the other hand, if we look at the same period, has a much more modest budget for promoting their products. They have their numbers under the selling and marketing expenses line in their income statement, and we find that last year their marketing budget was a mere $683 million. And I say mere because that's compared to Nvidia's $2.4 billion in the same period. So Nvidia is spending three and a half times more in marketing than AMD, while focusing mostly on G GPUs, whereas AMD's budget goes mostly towards their CPUs, and whatever is left goes to GPUs. By the way, AMD has stayed fairly level in how much percentage of revenue they are spending on marketing, at around 3 to 3.5% of their revenue being spent on it. So that's problem number one. No matter how good AMD's products are, Nvidia's GPUs will be seen by 3.5 more eyes than AMD's, and that's a conservative estimate given AMD's wider point. Portfolio. Now, I don't need to remind people about the quality of their marketing. Not only have AMD had less money invested in promotion, their marketing staff has been, well, lacking in awareness, let's just say. Nvidia's main marketing man is their CEO, Jensen Huang, who is the closest to a rock star in the tech world as you can get, confident on stage, humorous, and above all, a great salesman. Regardless of what you think of Nvidia's dubious anti-consumer and anti-competitive practices over the years, you can't deny that their CEO has Steve Jobs levels of carry when it comes to being the face of the company.
Now beyond the image problem, a market that can only support 100 million units per year just isn't going to be able to support the investments needed to succeed in the semiconductor industry, meaning it's simply not possible anymore to have a NAR 9 290X kind of moment when it costs $2 billion to have TSMC spin just one GPU on their leading node. A few weeks ago at IFA 2024, AMD's Jack Huyen, the senior vice president and general manager of the computing and graphics business group said the following, I'm looking at scale, because when we get scale, then I bring developers with us. So this was in response to AMD not competing with Nvidia on the high end in the coming generation of GPUs. What Huyen is saying is that rather than being king of the hill, they want a widespread adoption of their GPUs so that more developers take notice and support AMD's hardware better. This would in turn, one presumes, help push AMD's GPUs up the performance leather versus Nvidia's equivalents. Huyin continued, so my number one priority right now is to build scale to get us to 40 to 50 percent of the market faster. Do I want to go after 10 percent of the TAM or 80 percent? I'm an 80 percent kind of guy because I don't want AMD to be the company that only people who can afford Porsches and Ferraris can buy. We want to build gaming systems for millions of users. <laughs> now this is a statement that I think we should all keep pinned for the upcoming AMD GPU launches. AMD has been burned in the past for making fun of Nvidia and then failing spectacularly to deliver. Huyen is basically saying here that Nvidia's high end, so that's the top 80 class and 90 class GPUs, are only for the wealthy who can afford Porsches and Ferraris. While that may be true, I hope Huyen realizes that $1,000 for a 7900XTX, which was its launch price, is like selling a Cadillac for Ferrari prices, and the 7900XT was even worse value. So after this bombastic statement from AMD's vice president and seeing his claim of wanting to get up to 40% of the market at least, I hope AMD releases the next generation of their GPUs at most at the prices that Honda buyers can afford. Otherwise, it's just a hypocrisy. I mean, Nvidia fleeces you, but they don't hide it or make snarky remarks about competitors' prices. Huyin continued. Yes, we will have great products, but we tried that strategy, it hasn't really grown. ATI has tried this king of the hill strategy, and the market share has kind of been the market share. I want to build the best products at the right system price point. So think about price point wise, we'll have leadership. So no performance leadership, but rather value leadership. Now is this a permanent decision from AMD, or will it be like with the 5700 XT? So that was RDNA 1, which was sort of just one gen hiatus from the high end. Well, the answer might not be what AMD fans are hoping to hear. Huyin stated that, if I tell developers, I'm just going for 10% of the market share. They just say, Jack, I wish you well, but we have to go with Nvidia. So I have to show them a plan that says, hey, we can get to 40% market share with this strategy. Then they say, I'm with you now, Jack. Now I'll optimize on AMD. Once we get that, then we can go after the top. Now notice what Jack is saying here, AMD will only be going to build high-end GPUs again after they get 40%-ish of the market. <laughs> that could be a long time, if ever. I think it would take AMD a 70-class card that performed on the level of Nvidia's 80-class card and that cost half of Nvidia's 70-class card. So imagine an 8700XT that performs around the 5080 but costs half of what the 5070 costs. <laughs> That's the only way I can see getting anywhere above 30% of the market, let alone 40%. For perspective, let's say AMD has a Ryzen-style moment in the GPU space. In other words, let's say that in the next 3 or 4 years, AMD launches hit after hit GPU, with a disruptive product that catches Nvidia off guard in the same way that Ryzen caught Intel off guard. Well, how has that worked out for AMD in the desktop PC market? Ryzen is only 24% of the market 
market and in laptops even less at 19% and that's after five generations of Zen. So even if we see a similar success story with Radeon, it's going to take easily 10 years to get the 40%. And remember, Nvidia is not asleep at the wheel like Intel was when they were re-releasing four core CPUs for like 10 years straight. So if we take what Jack Huyin said at face value, we might never have a high-end GPU again from AMD, not one that can go head to head with Nvidia's top dog. However, it's not all bad news, and I think there's still hope for AMD. I mean, there's always the possibility that some freak new technology emerges out of AMD's labs to speed things up massively, but that's highly unlikely. I think where good things can happen for AMD is, and I know I've hammered on this to no end in the past, it's in APUs, especially if what the rumors are saying about Strix Halo are true. So if you've lost track of all the APUs going around, Strix Halo Halo are chiplet-based mobile processors with one or two Zen 5 CCDs paired with a large SoC die that includes a massive iGPU. This configuration can feature up to 16 full-size Zen 5 CPU cores and an integrated GPU with as many as 40 RDNA 3.5 compute units and a 256-bit LPDDR5X memory interface. So we're talking about an APU that comes with a 1080 Ti performance level. That's it's good enough still for most games at 1080p high settings, with some tweaking needed for the more recent AAA titles of course. Remember that a key point of AMD's strategy, according to Jack Huyen, is getting developer support for AMD's GPU technology, putting out an APU that can essentially take the 60 class GPUs away from Nvidia would be a way for AMD to get that level of support from developers. AMD's 40% market share in GPUs might not come in the form of discrete GPUs, but rather in integrated graphics. I did a review of a mini PC just recently that costs $200-ish, and that's for the whole PC. And I have some others in the pipeline that will be here on the channel soon. If AMD can partner with these companies and offer a stylish mini PC with a 1080 Ti level of GPU included, with the possibility to upgrade via a dock to a more powerful GPU down the line, I think AMD might actually get to that 40% number faster than people think. It's just that they are going about it in a smarter way, rather than trying to fight Nvidia head to head. Notice this phrase that Jack Huyen said in that same interview that I think went kind of under the radar. AMD is in a different place right now. We have this debate quite a bit at AMD, right? So the question I ask is, the PlayStation 5, do you think that's hurting us? It's 499. The PlayStation 5, as you know, runs on an AMD APU. I think what Huyen is saying here is that there is no competition in the console space. AMD lead that undisputed. The problem is that their margins there are minuscule. I mean, they have to be or they'll lose the Sony and Microsoft console contract to someone else. But imagine if instead of Sony, AMD were releasing their own mini PCs with powerful APUs or partnering with companies like B-Link, Minis Forum or Caddis and others to release powerful mini PCs in the same way they have partnered with handheld PC manufacturers like Steam and others. If Strix Halo does indeed dedicate that much silicon area to the GPU, then a new wave of mini PCs could be AMD's Trojan horse into consumers' homes, and as such, the hook that can fish developers onto their side. With devs focusing on their tech, AMD can, someday, come back to the king of the hill strategy, with high-end GPUs that give enthusiasts another 290x moment. Except this time maybe making a profit, and actually gaining market share. What do you think? Is this the right strategy from Lisa Su? Let me know in the comments. A huge thanks to my Patreon supporters for making this video possible. You can become a patron today by clicking the end cards in this video or going to patreon.com slash Cortex. If you do, you'll also get access to the Cortex Discord server where I hang out every day. Subscribe and give this video a like and share it around. Thanks for watching and until the next one.